And we're back, and we have got an all-star panel of military veterans today. For those of you who are new to the channel and new to Survival Dispatch News, we're going to go through each one of them. That'll tell you who they are and what they've done for our country. Then we're going to dive into today's, today's topic, pardon me, which is what we can learn from the Iranian attack on Israel over the weekend. There's lots of stuff that we can apply here in the homeland. And of course, Mike will grace us with the conflicted question of the day. Doc, Pete, you're up first. All right. Uh, yeah, it's great to be here, Chris. And uh, I'm going to start off with my, uh, as you asked, the, the bio, and I'll give you the, the version that you like. So in uh, 1983, I came in under Ronald Reagan. I was a grunt uh, infantry kid and had no idea what I was going to do with my life. But my dad was a patriot and said, you're going in. So 17, he signed me up. 18, I was I uh, I watched the Rangers jump into uh, Grenada from Fort Benning, waiting to go next. Nothing happened. So, uh, you know, I got out of the military, broke my leg on a jump. It was terrible. Pin, screws, plates. Said, you never jump again. So I did my time as a leg, got out and... Uh, you know, there I am. I'm going to be a doctor like my dad, a family doc, small town. Uh, and 9-11 uh, happened. I was in the reserves at the time. 9-11 happened. And uh, I said, well, I guess I'm not going to be a cosmetic surgeon now. So I'm going to I'm going to go back and, uh, and be a doc. I had been a SWAT team doctor for a while uh, while I was in residency. So I just went naturally to I, I, I kind of gravitated towards SF, became a battalion surgeon uh, for them, a flight surgeon as well. And then uh they said, and I did that job from 2003 till about 2010 when I went to General Mulholland's office and said, hey, you saw me at, you know, fifth group there. I was out there on the, on the, uh, you know, on the battlefield helping guys. That's where the patients are. He said, yeah. I said, well, I'm going to submit my uh, request to go to the Q course. He said, no. I said, then I'm going to, here's my second request is resign my commission and go back to being an E6 11 Bravo, which is a grunt. He said, well, I'm going to send you to the shrink. So he sent me to the shrink of which I went to med school with. He uh, signed me off real quick because I had secrets on him. And I went back to General Mulholland's office and uh, and uh, he let me go as a test case. So I was the first doc to go as a now we've had other docs, 18 Deltas that became officers. Uh, but I went to the 18 Alpha course, which is the uh, commander's course. And uh, it, it really helped me to understand the uh, the mission. Uh, and, you know, I understood the, uh, the mission somewhat, but to really fully understand it. But then became kind of a Swiss Army knife because I was able to operate in both capacities and uh, understand a deeper knowledge of what I was doing. Uh, I did that for a while, went to third group, uh, you know, a few deployments under my belt, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, uh, and then uh, did a one one tour uh, Afghan pack border, and then came back and uh, I contracted. I met a guy named Billy Waugh and he said, I got a job for you. So Billy took me down to meet some folks and I got off active duty in 2015, contracted for a little while, uh, was in the Texas National Guard at the same time, and then uh, Operation Lone Star kicked off, which put me on the border. And uh, so I worked as the task force surgeon, as well as a liaison to special operations in the Texas Rangers. So that's uh, what I what what taught me everything I know about the border, being down there and watching it every day and trooping the line, as my old go good officers used to do when I was enlisted. So I uh, had a great time with that mission. However, I was fired. I did uh, informed consents. I told the soldiers, you have a choice whether you want to take this, this uh, shot or not. And the general didn't like it. And I was just a lieutenant colonel and rock, paper, rank. I lost. And uh, I, well, I also told him it was an unlawful order. That That's not a good thing to tell when there's a one star and a 06 standing behind him. So that that kind of turned him red. There you go. That brought me to this where I'm at now. I'm at a think tank in Central Texas. We're more of a do tank. We don't write white papers. We use white papers to uh, start fires in the evenings. So <laughs> we get things done. And uh, we're, we're building a runway down here should the... Uh, should the need arise to uh, build, you know, take off a plane because it, it could get real Western down here. So I'm out every, about every night. Tonight I'll be back on the Rio down uh, a little bit further west, uh, further west uh, from Eagle Pass. And then it kind of goes northwest, but then out towards Presidio. We'll be working a few different operations. That's and what we do. That, that's awesome, Doc. Uh, before I move on to Don, I just got a quick question for you. How many states are there in the United States of America, Doc? No, Texas. No, Texas is a republic, though. <laughs> <laughs> that's... I'll argue that all day long. Illegal annex in 45, but that's another story. <laughs> that, that's that's a Texas joke for y'all. Just one, just Texas. Don Mann. Doc P, it's uh, great to be on the show with you. You're you're a true American hero, and it's a pleasure to meet you. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, my, my background, it's uh, I've spent a little over 20 years in the military, a little bit with the Marines, 
then SEAL Team 1, SEAL Team 2, and I retired out of SEAL Team 6, and then spent about 25 years or so working either full-time or part-time with different agencies. And now um, I'm just um, putting on events, sporting events that have to do with shooting and survival, and um, another event that has to do with just people helping people. So I'm just doing what I think is the right thing to do and things that are a lot of fun. And it's a pleasure to be on this show with you all. I appreciate it, Don. Don has the ability to uh, take people way beyond what they think their limits are. He's a very inspirational guy for those who have the, uh, who are blessed to work with him. And speaking of working with Don, Jeff MD, you've written a couple books with Don, but you're up. Yeah, I was an engineer by training, joined the CIA, became a case officer, and was fortunate enough to spend 24 of my 26 years in the field and outside of Washington, D.C., which is my proudest achievement, is not being in the swamp. Um, In the agency, I worked primarily on uh, nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, and advanced conventional weapons you know, rail guns, that kind of thing. Um, in my last assignment, I was actually in Texas and was responsible for a liaison with Border Patrol from basically Brownsville to El Paso. So we had over a thousand miles of border and spent a lot of time driving back and forth because there's really not a lot of flights down into the middle of nowhere. This video is sponsored by William Tell Archery Supplies, home of the Mini Striker Crossbow. Click the link in the description below to learn more. Thanks, Jeff. In Texas, that would be referred to as a fur piece. Yes. Essentially, you could translate that to a fur piece, but it's a fur piece in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff Nicholas. You're on mute, Jeff. You know, I'm that guy, right? I'm honored yeah. to be here. Well, it's good to see everybody. I'm I'm surprised that I'm in this room with these esteemed gentlemen and just glad to be here. And uh, my journey is I spent 20 years in the Army uh, flying uh, UH and MH-60s, uh, retired in 2006, had a small stint with the State Department as a contractor in Afghanistan, uh, flew EMS helicopters for many years, and then Five years ago, uh, a little over five years ago, I started a company called Compliant Technologies to help our men and women in uniform here in the States. And it's my way of just kind of being part of the part of the uh, solution instead of just complaining about the use of force and law and order and constitution and rule of law. I love my country um, and I love the Constitution and what we can ever do to help our men and women in uniform. That's what I'm about. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. My good friend, Randy Nance. Well, gosh, Jeff, you say that, but man, listening to all you guys' stories, I feel like I'm the uh, I'm the baby of the group, you know? <laughs> so uh, my story is basically started uh, right after September 11th, I enlisted in the Army. And uh, at that time, I was 33 and uh, had a small family. But, you know, I was in a a sales job that wasn't going too well. So I was going to get fired or quit soon. And my now ex-wife was working in uh, investments in uh, gas and oil drilling. So that job was toast right away after September 11th. And so we, you know, we had talked about it for a couple of weeks. And I said I was 33. And that's what I I told my family and and my, uh, my wife at that time. I'm like, you know, uh, if I don't do this, it's something I'm going to regret for the rest of my life. And so I probably should have went on in when I was 18 years old, but there really wasn't much going on. And even by, and I graduated in 86. So by the time Mogadishu happened, you know, that was like, it just made the news. So I didn't even know it was happening. And so, but there wasn't really anything going on. And I don't know, I just didn't, didn't join, but regardless after September 11th, I did. So, uh, you know, I, I uh, started off as a private and went into uh, two seven infantry in the third ID. And so I was with task force two seven and we were mainly the uh, lead element through most of Iraq, the initial invasion. We started off in Kuwait, obviously, but uh, I think after the three weeks, you know, uh, we had nine casualties. I mean, sorry, nine KIAs and 17 other casualties 
And one of those KIAs being Sergeant First Class Paul Smith, the guy that was killed in the airport, less than a, probably a half a mile from me, where I was in a blocking position on one of the uh, highways. And uh, uh, he was killed, one of the engineers we had. And so, but, you know, I came back in August of that year and, you know, uh, I was like, you know, I'd run into some ODAs in one of these ambushes that we came up on and, and they had led us into some specific areas where they had kind of channeled the bad guys in. And then we just, you know, came in and, and cleaned up the area. So, but it didn't take a rocket scientist for me to look at, you know, me and the privates, the, the guy, the squad I was with and look at the dudes on the ODA and think, you know, this is, that's where I need to go. So as soon as I got back, I uh, went to selection uh, got selected in uh, 04, uh, I'm sorry, um, January of, uh, it was 04. And uh, um, I went on to, uh, through the Q course, went on to fifth group. Uh, and in 06, uh, August of 06, I deployed with them. Uh, and we started off in Taji, uh, which was going to be a, a great mission for us. But this was the first reprieve fifth group it had since September 11th. So I was in second battalion. We were the only battalion that went over. First and third stayed back for this rotation. So after we were at Taji, probably 30 days, they're like, we don't have enough coverage in Baghdad. So we need you guys to come back. And, and we had went to the Dura house, which is where my team was the rotation before. And, uh, and I guess it was, you know, in 06 right there, you know, January 07 was the big push. So when I hit Iraq, it was like the the smell of defeat was in the air. There wasn't a lot going on with the conventional forces. And, you know, the only people out at night were us and the bad guys. And when I say us, I mean special operations guys and then the bad guys. And so we, uh, I guess, December 22nd of 06, we were on a mission. Uh, and, well, we had a tip. We had turned in with 23 bad guys on the on the tip. And that's a big pack. That's a huge package, in fact. Um but they were putting out a bunch of IEDs and EFPs on the road. And uh, and then they were also going around the neighborhood killing all kind of Iraqis and pretty much doing whatever they wanted. And so uh, I keep getting some alert from Google. But anyway, um, and so we went in, we were going to be going in, in the next 48 hours, but the conventional forces had just switched out. And the month before we had missed Abu Saif by like two minutes. And so... And that was because they didn't know their way around yet. And any of y'all been there know that when a, a conventional force comes and owns that battle space in the very beginning, all those individuals haven't been there yet. So, uh, so we were going in that night to get a clean route in and out. And basically, we, as soon as we get in the neighborhood, we just called the B team, let them know we're in. And uh, within 30 seconds, I see a roadblock to my left that they had built. And there's no doubt the Iraqis built it because it was like a destroyed car and some other rubble and garbage. Um, so I'm marking it on the map right where it is. And the next thing I know, the map's gone, my pen's gone. I had some clear lenses on them, they were gone. And I was just sitting there thinking to myself, because I'm confused now, I don't know what's going on. And I, th I all of a sudden I hear, you know, because uh, we have on our radios and I hear my team calling off IED drill, IED drill. And I'm thinking, well, was that us? You know what I mean? And then the next thing I know, I breathed in something horrible and my legs were fully involved. It was like lighting a matchstick. So what had happened, I got hit by an EFP and it came through the back rear well. And luckily for me, it grazed me, which I didn't even know the thing hit me in the beginning because as you all know, it happens in a fraction of a second. And so, but then it went through the fuel tank and I was in a brand new 1151 Humvee. I'm in the back right seat and that fuel tank runs right along the bot underneath the floor, you know, running uh, perpendicular with the vehicle. And so that sprayed me and set me on fire. And then one of our medics opened the door and that's basically when I spilled out and just rolled as best I could, you know, they eventually had to put me out. They, they kicked off an ambush, but luckily we still had 250 cals operable and they, they squashed that first little movement and then those guys just pulled off and waited until later when someone came and tried to recover the vehicle. The lucky thing for me is this was right off route senators and we're about 15 minutes from the green zone. 
And so there was no calling medevac. There was none of that. It was just getting a hold of B team. I don't know what happened and the, the known position we're at. And, and we hauled butt to the emergency room with the cash. And so I got there within 45 minutes, but, you know, I know I realized on the way, you know, we're crammed in this Humvee now and uh, something just said in the back of your head, you should check your butt. It was like a voice said, you should check your butt. And I reached back and it was just slick. And there was like, it was almost like nothing there. And I, when I pulled my glove up, you know, I had all the plasma and blood and, and I was like, oh, wow. And so that was my first indication that I'd actually been hit. So, you know, uh, I, I tell people all the time now I'm a legitimate half ass because it basically removed 50% of each cheek as it went right by. <laughs> and so, uh, you know, but I was burned. And so the, the other fortunate thing for me, one, I, I know I was in shock. The other, uh, I was extremely mad. One, I knew I wasn't going to finish the mission. I wasn't going back to the team house. It hadn't occurred to me yet that this was going to effectively end my military career in a few short years and certainly take me off the team for good and for final. And so, uh, but I knew that this wasn't good. I'd worked on an ambulance my first six years out of high school. So I knew, you know, I was trying to tell myself, maybe it's not as bad as I think, but I got to the cash, they put me under and, you know, I woke up five days later in San Antonio, Texas, and that started my long journey of healing and recovery what still lasts to this day. You know, I, I, they eventually sent me to SOCOM where I worked for the United States Care Coalition. I was one of the first 17 people hired at that organization and the stuff, we changed legislation. Uh, we got all kinds of things done with all of our guys that end up patients effectively because it's the patient advocacy side of SOCOM. Uh, it also put me in, pro, uh, con, uh, in, in the realm with a lot of nonprofits. So I, I worked for the Green Bay Foundation as the director of programs for the first four years out of, uh, out of the military for me. And, and now I work for what's called the Adaptive Training Foundation, where I'm a head trainer and slash athlete, because I'm also went through the program. And, and you have to be, uh, and it's not veteran specific, although we're about half veterans and we're half civilians, you have to be disabled to get in the club. It's a gym, but there's no membership. There's no public side to it. You, we just have the tribe and, and we have classes where we put you through nine weeks of physical training and we train you like a professional athlete. So it's not easy. It's extremely hard. Each week builds on the next, but the biggest part of it is, and the way what's really helped me and what's kept me around is we work on the mental aspect. We work on, you know, mindfulness. We work on uh, breath work. We, the big thing we work on is self-talk and goal setting and stuff like that. And so that is what has made a significant difference in my life. Certainly, you know, because I grew up in the area where if, if you made a slide, I could, I was one of the best. I could cuss myself up and down in 30 seconds or less for the slightest mistakes. So that's, that's kind of my story. I'm sorry it was a little long, but, you know, I, I don't, most of you guys understand, I believe. So thanks. And uh, I'm just happy and honored to be here and amongst you folks because I'm, I certainly uh, are going to be learning from you guys. Uh, likewise, but I appreciate you joining Randy and, and just so that the survival dispatch audience knows that uh, you lost your leg as a, as that's a result of the burns. And yeah, and so both legs are burned significantly. And when I first met Randy many years ago, uh, he was still, still going through trials and tribulations with his prosthetic, but doing tough mutters and, uh, you know, triathlons and all that crazy stuff because nothing was going to stop him. Kind of sounds like my good friend, Don Mann, you know, so definitely some synergy between the two. Mike Sterling, you're batting cleanup. As usual. Uh, hi, I'm uh, I'm Mike and uh, I'm, I'm the local EOD guy, so I'm, I'm nobody special. Um, so uh, let's see, 23 years in the Army, uh, first five years, uh, joined when I was 17, first five years, as, signed up as a combat engineer, um, uh, worked as a sapper during that time, uh, at the very end of the Cold War, Did uh, was actually in Berlin when the wall came down, uh, filling sandbags and string and wire because everybody was thinking that the Russians were going to punt, so that was an interesting time. Um went to uh tried to go to uh selection uh to get a long tab myself uh at bad tolls uh when they had to when they had that pre-selection program going on over there 
trashed both my knees in the process. That was out. Uh, eventually, you know, Cold War ended. Everybody said, "Hmm, okay, I'm I'm in the states, and everybody's getting everybody's getting pink slipped left, right, and center." And I asked myself, yeah, "I got to get a job, man." So I realized that the only thing that I was uh, I was capable of doing was being uh, working construction. And that was it because there was plenty of the market was saturated with people who know knew how to uh, shoot people and break their stuff way better than me. And the uh, Eastern Europeans were all over the place and they could do it way cheaper than us. So I said, hmm, what do I like doing? Well, I really like blowing stuff up. What do I not like? Well, I really don't like getting shot at. And I really like, you know, not being told what to do. And I said, you know what? Those EOD guys that I worked with over in Kuwait during the first Gulf War, those guys... Those guys, they always had their hands in their pockets and their hair and their mustaches and their beards were always out of regulation and, and nobody said anything to them. Hmm. So somehow, some way, they decided that they would take me on as a uh, uh, as an apprentice. Uh, they got me a school slot. Somehow, some way, I slipped through the cracks at EOD school uh, and made it all the way through NAV school EOD. Uh, got uh, Got slotted for some reason um with a uh uh with a counterterrorism uh line and i'm really not sure how that worked out and, and you know at that time if, if you weren't you know a super pt guy well if you were a super pt guy well then you know you you had a pretty good shot of going to the defo but yeah so eod if anybody doesn't know it's cool like special forces except it's for non-athletic people so uh <laughs> <laughs> so uh yeah um yeah i was just the paranoid guy that they stuck in the security room who kept on telling them listen there's this terrorist problem and everybody was like ah shut up don't worry about it so i kept on going to schools and doing cool stuff and i wound up as a uh i wound up as a technical escort specialist for chem and bioweapons uh i did a whole bunch of uh a whole bunch of schools in albuquerque and wound up on the uh on the national emergency response group uh, doing doing nuke stuff over there. Uh, I uh, I you know I had a commander who would just let me go to schools whenever I wanted them. So you know if we weren't busy, I was going to a school. I took a whole bunch of forensic courses, and I wound up when the war happened. I was one of three uh, three EOD techs in the entire military who was a uh, certified forensic specialist and had a background in in WMDs and also was uh was foolish enough to have all the backgrounds that i had and technical intelligence all all played in so i was over in in k2 with everybody and and digging through all the stuff searching for uh searching for missiles in uh in afghanistan uh you know doing the big stinger hunt all that kind of stuff uh did several deployments over doing fun stuff mostly in the centcom region they put a tan tag on my on my file so i was i was running all over the place with fifth group in in north africa and the horn of africa and and various middle east countries realize you know this this is a whole lot easier to be an eod tech just as an enabler with you guys than it was to actually have to go through all that stuff with selection so yeah i was like why, why didn't i do this in the first place so <laughs> <laughs> so yeah I, i'm just the guy that's here man I, i'm i'm the comic relief uh over here at, at survival dispatch and that's that's all i do um that's that's not all mike does but uh just like everybody else on this panel um a humble man which is a sign of, of greatness in my opinion <clears throat> mike give us the conflict the question of the day and then we're going to jump right into this iranian attack on israel Conflicted question of the day, because PSYOPs is a beautiful thing. If I can't twist somebody's head up today, it's not a good day. Ah. Oh, and Don, I, I'm sorry. I let, I forgot about you. I, I, I totally apologize. I forgot to ask you how your beach ball was today, because I hadn't seen it on your nose. No. It fell off. I need more yeah. training. <laughs> It's absolutely necessary for anybody that doesn't know for EOD techs to talk smack at seals. We get beat up and slapped around and stuff like that, but we continue talking crap through broken teeth. So, okay. A deadly flu outbreak has infected one third of your group. You don't have the means to quarantine them or the medicine to help them. 
do you vote with the rest of your group to banish them from your group or do you take it upon yourself to eliminate the infected ones before it spreads any further wow the answers to this and more at the end of our episode and that would be why uh, the decks are called conflicted all right so just because we have such a large panel today um if you've got something you want to interject into the conversation just give me a finger like that and i'll call on you next but i'm gonna go to doc pete first doc based on the reports that we have what happened over the weekend iran attacking israel what are some things that we've learned from that? Right. Uh, well, essentially, you know, what you had was a uh, like the old Cool Hand Luke movie, a failure to communicate. What we have here is a failure to communicate. So, you know, information drives operations. And uh, we know that there's a pretty robust system in the Iranian theater. I'm sorry, the Israeli theater when it comes to information ops uh, in the form of their uh, Mossad, which, you know, depending on which side of that you're looking at and who's whose team you're on over there, because there are a couple of different teams, kind of like the uh, ISI, you know, and, and all those, you, you know that there's different groups that work out there. And sometimes even in our own intelligence communities, we have different silos and sometimes one doesn't speak to the other. And I'm sure that Jeff could attest to this is what I found in some of the things that I was working on as a contractor. There were people that were doing completely the opposite sometimes or would seem like that as perception is reality. So in this case, what I, what I see happening there and, and what we need to worry about is I look at the uh, most comments and I look at patterns and based upon my information on the border and what I've seen with the growth of, and we're talking primarily about a drone attack that's initiating something. It's kind of like the B-52 attacks of before, or you, you, go, you, you count on the Air Force before you do a landing or the Navy naval aviators before you do a, a beach landing to pepper the battlefield, to, to prepare the battlefield for the, the beach landing. So... Is this going to be followed on with that? We don't know yet, but we do know that there was a, a, a salvo of a significant amount of drones. And now I'm going to say for us how we would be prepared. In Texas, that alligator is real close to our canoe. But because of the players that are on the battlefield down here, and, and I've got a beautiful chart, and someday I'll share it with you guys and throw it up here, of all the players on the battlefield and how they operate. Um, we have everything from Iranian-backed uh, trend, not trend, well, yeah, trend al -Agua. Uh, some of these, you know, gangs that are up in the northern cities, but also the the cartels themselves, which are somewhat affiliated with Venezuela as well, and the cartel de Sol. You know, a lot of people don't really think about them, but they are probably one of the bigger organizations down here that have the most amount of uh, uh, umph behind them. Okay, you know, we think of intelligence committees in our hemispheres. That I look at the Cubans as our most uh, significant threat, but down in this region on the border, the the that alliance there that we're talking about iranians now in venezuela sometimes coming across our border that are docked as venezuelans who are using this technology and what am i talking about in this drone technology when i was on the border 150 to 200 incursions took place across our southern border and that was to drop off uh packages of different kind of uh you know narcotics i didn't open every package the only one that i ever dealt with was a fentanyl package but uh you know, that was uh, 150. Right now, we're looking at 1,000 incursions a week. Okay, so that was my whole time on the border, 150, and that was two years ago. And now we're looking at 1,000 a week incursions coming across the border. It's so drone, much drone incursions. Drone incursions. Okay. So much cheaper for them to drop those behind lines, fly nap of the earth, drop low, stay under radar. Uh, there, there, there are ways to pick those up. You know, I've, I've flown drones on the border, too, and Within 20 minutes, I'm talking to a, you know, a border patrol agent or somebody that's that's targeting me to say, what are you doing flying here? I'm like, well, I'm working with y'all. I'm just in the, you know, the soft community. But, uh, you know, so sometimes we got to deconflict the airspace, if you will. But in this case, they're dropping it off. Then somebody comes by, picks it up. It saves them from having to uh, do the mule system where the mules carry it across. We can see them. We got sensors and cameras along the border all up and down 1250 miles of texas border in the most common places so what are we looking at now well if i'm looking at an attack like that as a civilian and i'm wondering about that then i have to think in a most dangerous course of action mindset as i'm preparing the battlefield and the information preparation of the battlefield how would i create the most amount of chaos shortest amount of time and what would my targets be because as some of us know at this panel here the Carver matrix, you know, criticality, accessibility, recuperability, all the things that a, a good 18 
um, Charlie would use, an engineer, to destroy things, or a sapper as well, um, you understand this is how we target things. So I, am I going to knock this power grid out for a long time or a short time? Am I going to take out this bridge or am I going to go after a dam? So, for example, during this uh, eclipse, every one of our critical infrastructure pieces in Texas and our own power grid, because there's only one state, um, we we had those things, uh, you know, two up with uh, guys with kit and two up with uh, patrol cars, because we didn't know what kind of chaos was going to ensue when you got a... a uh, federal government calling down to the EOCs, emergency operation centers along the line of the eclipse, saying, hey, be prepared to survive for three days just in case. Well, now you got this fear attack going on. Nothing happened, right? Nothing happened. But me as a guy that that liaises with the EOCs, I'm in there talking to them going, here's your most likely, here's your most dangerous. Most likely nothing's going to happen, but be prepared for. So as a civilian, what I would want to know from a group like this would be, what are our what are our thoughts on what those targets would be and would this be a long term or a short term we could speculate all day long and i and i do have my own personal thoughts on that but i i think that because we are so robust down here and texas has taken the lead as a state to operate under the state constitution and the and the amendments that are, that are afforded that in the federal you know the us constitution um ag paxton's done a good job of trickling down the rules of engagement so that we can be left to bang and not get sucker punched that's to let citizens know hey look we care right and there are still people like us that are out of uniform that are doing the same thing uh, with different authorities so we can find and fix locations we just can't finish but we can hand it to the people that can't so that's the warm fuzzy in the in all this but there's a part of me that says i smell war you know i smell chaos i smell that and it, and i don't like that part because i've been there we've all been there and done it but um, you gotta, you know, we gotta keep, keep our eyes open 360 plus one. We're looking at drones. So it's not just here. It's the plus one. Yeah. I think it's interesting, doc, how you hit on, uh, power grids and drones, because that was how this whole thing kicked off between Iran and Israel, right? They, they hacked the power grid in Tel Aviv, shut most of the power down. Then they launched a hundred plus drones. And we're not talking small consumer drones, like larger drones. Oh, sir. Sure. Before they started lobbying ICBMs and whatnot. And here's something to consider. A Lakota, about a less than a month ago, a Lakota went down on the border. Pretty robust aircraft. Not much can take it down unless you're literally shooting at it. Nobody shot at it, but it went down. Now, at the same time, a member of a certain organization down there, and it's still being you know, sorted out, so I'm not going to say anything until I know, but a, 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 somebody from the southern south part of the border, from across the Mike side, Mexican side, uh, filmed the whole thing. Now, there's question as to whether or not there was a drone intervention involved in that. Now, I do know this, that on the border in my particular couple of years down there, and especially, you know, a civilian, but uh, as a con, well, I'm not really a contractor. I work for myself, but um, I know that they are directed energy weapons on that border and they and they come in the form of a uh, a uh, they look almost looks like a telephone. It'll be on a telephone pole and be inside of like an igloo case. It's very cheap. They have the money to do that. It's a lot cheaper to do that, to disrupt, to deny space, to deny territory than it is for them to put somebody on the ground. And we were fighting over the Fronton Island there. Uh, the, we call it the Island of Death. It's right there at yeah. Fronton. Uh, you know, Texas Rangers were getting after it down there. That's U.S. territory. It's Texas mm -hmm. territory. And the cartels owned it. They don't anymore. Um, we flattened that place with, the, you know, fire and just, you know, killed all the... It was a, it was a drop-off point for cartel drugs. But now they're less apt to go after that kind of drop-off point, that cache site, because of the fact that they are flying over. And with the directed energy stuff, that tells me they got the technology and the money. They were making hundreds of millions of dollars a month on PISO, on tax, PISO, P-I-S-O, the little bands that people wear. $400, $400 million a month when I was down there, that's just cartel del noeste in the region that I was in, the Roma slash Miguel Alamon side. So all these things put them on the on a heat map, and it's telling you, if it's if it's got a hoof beat, it ain't a zebra. It's a horse. Yeah, that's uh, your firsthand exposure. To this is is pretty amazing, Doc. Because you know, the, if people haven't been to the border, we actually had somebody comment on one of our posts today that we were lying and that they had spoken to friends on the border. There's no invasion. There's no invaders, migrants, whatever you want to call it, coming across. That this is all hyperbole made up by conservatives. So it's good to have somebody like you on who's 
physically been there multiple times. Mike can't you know, believe they busted us. They finally caught us. Right. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Jeff weigh in on, on the docs comments on what the most likely attack vectors are like where, where are the weaknesses and what's most likely to happen? You're on mute. You're still on mute. <laughs> No, I was down on the border with Border Patrol, and we took the airboat up and down at Laredo. And what I did notice is that they were all wearing bulletproof vests, and I had nothing. Um, but they were pointing out where all the cartel people were on the other side. They knew where they were. They were watching us every second of the way. So they're very organized, and they're very capable. And this was, you know, seven, eight years ago. Um, but as far as where to attack, it depends on what you're trying to accomplish. If you're trying to accomplish panic, you attack, you attack a large gathering of people or you ideally multiples at the same time. You know, you hit something in Tucson, something in Phoenix. I'm going to use Arizona because that's where I am. Maybe something down in Nogales. But if you do them all at the same time or you do two in one city, because as Keith has said, everybody's going to show up to the first one. Then you do another one. There's nobody left. All the emergency personnel were at the first one. That's if you want panic. If you want to cripple a response, take out communications and take out power. You can take out power and not necessarily take out communications. Most cell tower, most cell sites have backup generators that'll work for a few days, but only a few days. They run out of they run out of gas like everything else. But if you take out the power grid and you take out the cell network any response is going to be crippled because it's going to make it difficult difficult for them to call in reinforcements. You know, try and call up the National Guard without a telephone. How's that going to happen? I mean, these are guys that are, you know, they have day jobs. Um, so I would, you know, if I were them, I would go after choke points, uh, high, you know, high voltage uh, transformers. They're, there's very few of them. They're very crucial and they're hard to replace. Um, so it just depends on what they're trying to accomplish. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we've, we've seen a number of instances where there've been these cyber attacks incursions, whether it be small sections of the power grid or communications grid. And the Chinese have bragged that they have access to 24 major networks and that they can turn us off with the flick of a switch. So it, it's not a big stretch after what we just saw in Iran and Israel where you know, they knock out power and then they come in with the drones. So, Jeff Nicholas, question for you. You were in Mogadishu when the shit literally hit the fan. How fast did that take going from a controlled situation to absolute chaos? And how long did it take to regain order? Well, it all happened pretty quickly. It felt very surreal. And, you know, prior to that event, we had seven successful missions and uh, one of the things I commented on when I would go around the country was I, I believe that we became overconfident and then we became a reactive and not a proactive force. All of a sudden now you're having to pick up the pieces and go back and organize, uh, you know, what happened with trying to organize the Malaysians in 10th Mountain and everything else because we were an isolated, self-contained unit. Now we needed help. Uh, so things happen pretty quickly. I mean, look, look at the 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 direction our country has gone i would just like to make one overall macro comment from that with the tactics and everything you guys are talking about and choke points and all the things everything that i think this discussion is about is important but i want to make sure everybody listening knows that we're all and i would think that i can speak for the group we're all fully aware that it's our situation as a country is too stupid to be stupid I call it infiltration, not invasion. Had people lived and died by the Constitution, if had we had truly elected individuals that loved this country and loved this people, we never would have an open border. Had we had law enforcement that didn't have their hands tied, we'd have no. We wouldn't have things like no cash bail. We wouldn't have uh, an administration flying millions and letting millions of people in and basically welding the door open to let people come in to create chaos and crime and everything else. So I think we all as a panel understand what's going on. There is no conspiracy theory here. Things are vetting itself out 
and daily we're realizing the compromise and the treason and everything else that's taken place where at some point, if, because collectively we could have all the militias in the world, the compromised United States government has their finger on the pulse or on the, on the trigger of the nuclear devices and everything else in the military. And we've been co-opted at every level. Unless military leaders decide to stand up and say, we're going to defend the constitution against all enemies, foreign and domestic. We have a very hard road to hoe. And we're probably all going to be living in the Republic of Texas when this is all over as a last stand. Maybe the Alamo is going to exist again. I don't know. But we're in a very precarious situation as a country. I just wanted to throw that out there because we're talking about these specific things. But I want people to understand that we're very well of the overall scheme of the maneuver of what these traders, for lack of a better term, have put together for this country. Yeah, traders is a is a good description. So just to tie what you said to our the conundrum or one of the conundrums we currently face is we have a, a massive number of people who've come into the country from countries that we have reciprocity with, where we know that there's about 200,000 convicted criminals from those countries here. But then you have many hundreds of thousands of other criminals that are here from countries that we don't have reciprocity from or with, I should say. So you have gangs like Tren and, uh, you know, MS-13, but we also have a large Chinese contingent, 7,000% increase year over year between 2023 and 2022 for Chinese apprehended at the border. So best guess is somewhere around 30,000 Chinese nationals. I can't remember who it was. It might have been somebody in this pattern who essentially said, China is not a country that you just decide to leave. Like, you know, it's, it's not like here where we decide to go travel somewhere. You have to have permission from the Chinese government to leave. So there's 30,000 people minimum, at least. They say there's actually 23,000 between October and January just crossed. But 181 countries is the last uh, number that I heard. I, um, yeah, Mike, I got to mention this in case you didn't know. Uh, the doc and I, we were at Mar-a-Lago a couple weeks ago. And... <laughs> <laughs> and uh you know okay it's getting <laughs> to the point where it's it's this is gonna be just like doc you 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 and randy you're gonna recognize this the back at brag stories this is gonna be his back <laughs> at brag hey long story short as we've mentioned it before and doc can testify to it the new york city police commissioner who was serving during 9 11 is was the source of some of the numbers that i just put out there and they're they're legitimate numbers but here's where i'm going with this because i'm going to go to you next don is that regardless what the number is, it's a really big number of people here with criminal records, violent criminal records, and sleeper cells. When did you first become aware of, in a professional capacity, that we had sleeper cells here? And what's what's the difference in scale from then until now, based on your perspective? And that's for me, Chris? Yes, sir. Yeah, so... In the 90s, we were chasing down sleeper cells. We knew sleeper cells were here. Early 2000s, I was on surveillance for some people, Islamic faith in Washington State. And um, so I, I, I knew back then. Uh, what A couple of things that were said, you know, Doc, when, when you said that some believe that war is imminent, um, I, I think we all, I mean, that was, what, 20-something years ago. I think we all have to believe and would be naive to believe that war is not imminent. We have to know it's coming. The, the, the U.S. government has failed us badly. Not only have they failed us, they're enabling the enemy. They're opening those doors, welding them open, and forcing these people, forcing these people into our country to attack our country. We've never been in a position like that. Fortunately, we have dark on the border and good people like that fighting for us. But I think we have those fighting for us. The front line now is on the border. That's the front line of defense of our country. And what we have to do, we have to do our best, like Chris, your great program here, to get the word out that this is happening. We're not fanatics. This is the truth. We're putting out the truth. And this is what you have to do to survive in the world that's right in front of us. It's uh, something we've never faced before. We've never faced our government enabling the enemy to destroy our country. And that's where we are right now. And um, 
I'm proud to be among you guys helping spread this word. And I, I'm do that for the rest of my life. Just spread the word and help people that offend against the enemy and to protect our homes and families. Jeff. You know, for people who don't believe the, oh, there's no sleeper cells. Remember 9-11? Those were four ISIS sleeper cells. They infiltrated the country. They established themselves in different parts of the country. They worked as four separate teams. You know, yeah, they coordinated their attack, but they really didn't act, interact with each other that much. A lot of them were in Atlanta. A lot of them were in New York. They were in different parts of the country. They operated like a sleeper cell, set four sleeper cells. And from their perspective, they were very successful. I mean, look what they did. So for people to think that Hezbollah, Iran, Hamas, that China, that none of these people missed that lesson, you're smoking something. Of course they did. They go, wait, hey, that worked. Let's do that again. And there's nothing to stop them, Not especially not this administration. What's crazy, Jeff, is that we live just north of Daytona Beach, which is where Jeff's alma mater, Embry-Riddle, is. Mm -hmm. And I know firsthand people who were flight instructors at the time that were told firsthand by these guys, you don't have to teach me how to land the plane. I just need to know how to take off. And nobody acted on that, which is just astonishing. So, Randy, I want to go to you next, uh, based on your experience. When when you encountered that roadblock, and uh, the way you describe it, it was pretty makeshift, right? We, yes. We've talked for a long time on Survival Dispatch that if we end up in a, a lapse of rule of law, and I don't believe that the if the rule of law... Um, diminishes for a period of time it will come back like we also caution people that be careful even if the shit's hitting the fan there will be a reckoning and it doesn't mean that you have a license to do bad things to other people but we've seen comments mike can tell you about this for at least two years now where people make comments on our videos i don't prep i'm not going to prep i'm going to take whatever i want it at gunpoint and there's nothing you can do to stop me and Part of that's internet bravado, but part of that is evil people telling you truly how evil they are. And where I'm going with this is that we've cautioned people in urban environments that if they have the opportunity to get to a rural environment, that's a lot safer place to be. And that it's highly likely that once, you know, the reality of the situation sets in that there's going to be marauders essentially taking whatever they want. That roadblock that was that makeshift roadblock caused you to essentially take a detour, right? And it led you into a, you know, a, I'm trying to think of an ambush for lack of a better term. What do you think the time was invested on the part of the bad guys to do that? And how likely is that to happen in, in our, yeah, you know, in our cities, for example, go ahead. Yeah. So, um, so, you know, specifically, it did not change our route of path. We were coming in a road, and I just happened to see it on a road to our left. Now it's makeshift. So, you know, if, if that came down to our own country, we would be doing the same thing. And, and and effectively, that could have been between a Shia and a Sunni neighborhood there in Baghdad. I don't know what it was for. It definitely would hinder us as well. But, you know, to the point of your question, you know, uh, just like in this country, before there was a rule of law everywhere, you know what happens out there in the countryside, not just the country, but certainly in the cities where there's a lot. And to your point, when Baghdad fell, I don't know if any of the rest of you guys were here uh, or were there when Baghdad fell and finally, you know, the three weeks it was over. But, you know, what happened next first was a level of looting for three days that you can only describe as biblical. I've never seen anything like it in my life but it's human nature and if the rule of law all of a sudden goes absent here for whatever reason the same reasons maybe we've been attacked or maybe there's been some sort of major disruption to our uh, way of life um, people will do that again and to, to the same thing there will be people that have enough guns and enough power that they're going to think well they're just going to go start taking things 
because after that after that looting, uh, you know, they, we allowed it for three days. We're the ones that put it to a stop, or it would have kept going. And they took every single thing everywhere. I mean, from dealers, car dealerships to every bit of furniture out of out of houses, out of businesses. They took everything that wasn't bolted down and even some of the bolted down stuff. I saw an, uh, one of the most incredible things I saw through the whole trip there was I'm on a checkpoint on a road there in Baghdad and we're watching all this looting going on and the fights that went on for it for certain periods. But all of a sudden I see coming down the road, uh, I see something, I'm not sure what it is, but as it gets closer, I can tell now it's somebody carrying something. And when the person gets in front of me, it's an old lady that she looked like she could have been 90, but she had this huge porcelain bathtub, real fancy one, carrying on her back. She was hunched way over. She had one arm up over the top holding this thing. And she had just came as far as I could see her down the road, walked all the way in front of me and kept going, you know. So that's that's the level of what you're going to see people take stuff. What happened after that three days was then the criminals took over. So then there were checkpoints that weren't Iraqi checkpoints. They weren't our checkpoints. They were criminal checkpoints that were shaking down the public for everything they had. They would pull you over. They would kill the folks. They would steal any money or anything else they have. And again, I think that comes back to human nature. And you think of, you probably do would, would rather be in a rural area because the cities are going to be absolute chaos. People will lose their minds and they will do exactly that. There will be people who are going to go out and take whatever they want. And they're not going to care about moral reasons or, you know, ethical or God forbid something that would fall under the law because there won't, there'll be an absence of law. Yeah. Jeff, you look want to speak world. to that? Oh, we got Just look at, look at black Friday. You're willing, they're willing to shoot somebody over a TV. You oh. Imagine when there's no food in the grocery stores. Right. So that that's, that's, that's going to play out no, no matter where. And if you think about what the enemy you're talking about hitting different points, it takes a long time to build something. It takes a fraction of time to destroy it. Mm -hmm. And you start destroying things that, that, that don't take that long to destroy. You can really upset the apple cart pretty quickly to where, especially if you do it in multiple locations simultaneously, um, you're going to have a lot of problems. And, and that's probably what's going to, you're going to talk about here is what, what we can do to prep for that. Mm -hmm. But uh, it does not take much it does not take much to tip the apple cart over. The government has gotten us lulled. We became apathetic. We've been we've been destroyed from within through our government and appointed leaders over us to kind of pave the way for the destruction or for the people that are going to do the destroying. And they're going to do it in a very short order. And we're going to have to rebuild out of it. You know, I I don't disagree, Jeff MD. Before I go to Mike, because Mike was in Solder City and Baghdad yeah. area, and I want to hear some firsthand stuff from him. But you go first, Jeff. Well, I, I was just saying, you know, okay, you look at the bridge in Baltimore. It took literally four seconds for that thing to collapse. Four seconds, and it's going to be down for weeks. The port's going to be closed for weeks, and that bridge won't be replaced for years. But you look at if you want to look at human nature. Look at New Orleans when the hurricane hit. Mm -hmm. People are wading through waist-deep water with stolen televisions. They weren't looking for food or medicine or trying to find a safe place. They were just stealing crap. And, you know, it's and it happens pretty much everywhere. I mean, the my brother-in-law was in Los Angeles during the Rodney King riots. And he said a lot of the looting, and I don't want to disparage any one racial group over the other. He goes, he says, with the Rodney King thing, he says, yeah, you would have expected it would be the black people that were so pissed off. But it was Hispanics that were doing a lot of the looting because they were just taking advantage of the chaos. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, you can be white, you can be black, you can be Asian, you can be Hispanic, you can be whatever. You know, if you're a jerk, you're a jerk. Sure. Fortunately, that doesn't have any color boundaries. Well, and the, just, the good book says everything. there are none righteous, no, not one. We're all capable of doing crazy things. Absolutely. Yeah, this is true. Mike, can you kind of pick up there and, and also circle back to Randy's comments with regards to how fast you saw things devolve in Iraq? And just, you know, are we really that much different than the Iraqi people if you take away 
all of our amenities. If you take away the electricity, the communications, the grocery stores, are we really that much different as far as how human nature, as Randy said, would react to this stuff? I just honestly think that uh, that that we've had a great run, guys. Um, but I, I think we can pretty much just chalk this up and say that you know the human race is is not a viable species on this planet. It we're just we're too stupid to survive in numbers. That's all there is to it. Um, yeah, I we saw things just go absolutely wild as soon as the as soon as uh, Jaish Al Mahdi, the the jam militias started started uh, kicking the. Uh, the Iraqis out of Sadr City because we it was a no go for us in 2008. We, no coalition forces were allowed in there. It was only Iraqi government, uh, military, and police were allowed in there, and they folded like a wet tortilla, quick, fast, and in a hurry. There's every one of their sites got overrun in mere minutes. Uh, the only ones that didn't were uh were ones that basically were getting shot up by apaches so uh as soon as that happened then that's when the looting started again and it was astounding how fast everything went just like that it just came apart like like a cheap korean suit it was crazy um and that looting again went for like three days and during that three days we were pretty much just hemming them in hemming them in hemming them in and it ended on its own because there wasn't anything else to steal and and they and and that was the point that everybody started realizing oh no we're all trapped in this city together and surrounded by americans in a siege situation and we said now we got y'all in one place. We're coming for you. So yes, um, yeah, humans will devolve like that. I don't care what color you are. I don't care what nationality you are. That veneer of civilization peels off real easy. So I mean, essentially, thanks, Mike. That was good commentary, actually, on everybody's part. Is is that the system is much more fragile than many people realize. And it won't take much to kind of devolve to that point. Before we get into recommendations of what uh, Americans and friends of America can do, it, if and when, you know, this kicks off, we, we know pretty much for certain that something's going to kick off. What we don't know is when it, exactly it's going to happen and how severe it's going to be. But I want to ask uh, Doc a couple questions here. Let me just bring this up. This is breaking news. And, and by the way, we can't show certain news organizations without being demonetized and also having reduced visibility. So the links to this stuff, as I mentioned before, are on our website, but I can't show it on here directly. Have you in particular, Doc, caught this where there've now been flyers discovered by these NGOs handed out to um, people heading here, the, the migrant slash invaders? Absolutely. And having having talked to thousands of them in, in the years, you know, when somebody come across, and of course, they're they're dry, they're they need some fluids, whatever. We're still helping people. So I just ask them questions. And of course, this is a common theme is, well, we were invited here and we're going to, you know, we're going to help vote for this guy. But also, you probably got this same document from the same guy that I won't mention the news organization, but uh, Army Ranger friend and uh, works for an agency, a news agency. And uh that's just down there in Matamoros across from Brownsville. And it's not that far, but we've seen the same documents that have come across at different points. So it's just from a different uh, source. That happens to be the, the group down in Matamoros. So yes, that, that is a, you know, kind of the Cloward Piven thing where you, you transfer migration, uh, you bring people in, you, you do the same thing when I was stationed in Jordan and uh, you saw Hadalot and Rootbond, two camps on the border. See, the King of Jordan said, you're not coming in. And they created these huge camps, 100,000 in one and about 70,000 in the other. There were refugees from the uh, Syrian campaign. So what they did was they routed them up through Turkey and sent them out through Europe and through Greece and Bulgaria and on to Balkans on into, uh, well, they, they couldn't go into Poland, but, uh, you know, they, they, they ended up now in Sweden and all that. So you see that transfer migration thing. We're seeing it over and over again. History reflects itself. It's doing the same thing that goes back to the, you know, the days of, uh, of you know, 2000 years ago where a war displaces people. In this case, uh, the displacement is created 
by what I believe is is uh, is a purposeful event to to fuel this you know invasion you know not not a kinetic invasion but uh, very well could be you know if 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 the atmospherics proof so so, so look we live in a semi permissive environment all the way up to uh, the Red River right now and that that's pretty hard to say considering I had to take off the Texas National Guard uniform and thought that I was doing our, we were doing our job to keep that from happening. When I was on the border, it went to the Foul Furious, which is the first checkpoint coming north. But the semi permissiveness lies in the ability to control, um, to operate in the open with things that are completely uh, considered unlawful and, uh, and the amount of coercion, uh, elicitation, uh, subversive activities that are taking place are just too numerous to count right now. And I'm not, you know, I'm a glasses half full guy, but I'm just telling the truth. That's the way it is. So before I go to Mike, I just want to be crystal clear for our audience and our followers. Um, this claim that these people are essentially being bribed to vote for the Democrats. And of course the Democrats say there's no such evidence. This is not happening this document that's circulating right now, there's lots of people attesting to its authenticity, but this isn't even the first time you've heard of it, correct? I just want to make sure we put a fine point on it. Absolutely, 100%. Okay, that, that's key. Mike? So to the point of of this being labeled as an invasion, uh, <laughs> if you look historically, I'm am amateur historian, um, uh, you know, just call me a shade tree historian if you want to. Uh, the Mongols during the days of the Golden Horde used to specifically intentionally drive huge masses of refugees into their enemies' territories specifically for the purposes of undermining everything and sowing confusion in, in their enemies' territories. And then once they were done with that, well, then they just kill everybody anyway. But I believe, uh, and th I mean, that's a tried and true method there. And I believe Sun Tzu specifically speaks about it uh, as a viable technique in his Art of War as well. All right. Th thanks for adding that, Mike. I was not aware of that. Jeff? Well, <clears throat> World War II, when the Germans, you know, Operation Barbarossa, when they invaded Soviet Union, they also purposely drove refugees before them because it would clog up the roads, slow down the retreating Russian forces so they couldn't reorganize and put up a defense. They couldn't travel. They had to abandon equipment because the roads were just clogged and so they could get out on foot, and they, but they couldn't get out with their vehicles. So that's why they lost so much equipment. They would the, the Germans would encircle entire armies and capture them whole because one, Stalin was stupid and said, you're not allowed to retreat. But even when they said, screw that, we're going to retreat anyway, they couldn't retreat. The The infrastructure was just destroyed and clogged up with the refugees. So, you know, that almost, you know, you know, Soviet Union almost went away. They did the same thing in France. Yeah. So this is a really good time to share this news story which is a staggering number. And I've heard this number uh, <clears throat> bandied about a number of times. <clears throat> Excuse me. But if memory serves me right, when Trump first wanted to build the wall, he was asking for $5 billion from Congress. And this is not the only report that I've seen saying that the cost to us as taxpayers is $150 billion a year to <clears throat> excuse me, look after these illegal immigrants, invaders, whatever you want to call them. Something I brought up before, I'll bring it up again because it's very germane uh, and relative to all y'all, is that there were 166,000 doctor's appointments that veterans had at the VA last year that were canceled so that the VA could deliver medical care to illegal immigrants. It's like, it's like the ultimate slap in the face, uh, you know, as far as I'm concerned. So I'm going to go back to you, Doc, just because you've been on the front line multiple times in different capacities as well. I know I'm not asking you're not the GAO or anything like that, but does that number strike you as something that is reasonably accurate? Absolutely. You know, the, the receipts on this come from uh, Todd Bensman with Center for Immigration Studies. We talk pretty much every other day via text or email. So that that information as to how much goes into that coffer that then 
comes out of the taxpayer dollars, which goes to a UN organization, which is illegal. Um, but we have to, to us, it's illegal. It's unlawful, right? But we have to go back to January of this past year when uh, Biden and, uh, and AMLO and Trudeau met in Canada and created the Declaration of North America, which basically in their eyes, almost like an executive order, because it's a declaration or like a resolution, which is a strongly worded document that says that we are going to open the borders up. So we're going to change the names of these people because it's all about the dialectic sometimes, the Hegelian dialectic, if you will. And it's it's now they're they're not illegal immigrants or illegals or you know invaders, but they are undocumented uh, migrants, which newcomers softens, newcomers. It softens the blow. It's like saying human trafficking when it's slave sex trafficking or when it's sometimes, you know, worse than that. And so we, we, we have to keep speaking the truths, which to me, when I spoke in McKinney last night to a group of 300, you know, great Americans that are there to hear the truth, um, there, there were looks of shock and tears rolling in their faces when we had to tell exactly what's happening on the border. It's not humanitarian it, at all. It's overwhelmed a system that was already kind of broke. And, uh, and now we're playing whack-a-mole with the needle in the stack of needles, which are the bad guys trying to come in. So uh, that's what this this has created. It's a very difficult op operating environment for our side to, to pinpoint that. As the you're sergeant the, in the room, I have to say, bullshit. <laughs> you're the third Not for person. for what you're saying, but that it's happening in the first yeah. place. Yeah, yeah, no, I know what you meant. I feel the same, brother. You're the third person who's used the frame whack-a-mole. Uh, term pardon me whack -em in the past 24 hours that i've spoke to with regards to this stuff i have a question for you pete and then the rest of the uh, uh panel as well because i i suspect that y'all have seen this stuff happen but there are images coming out of israel right now in the the outlying areas especially bordering with lebanon where the israelis have been evacuated they're gone uh, they've just picked up and left my question is, I'd love to hear anything that all y'all have seen firsthand in theaters of war that resembles this and give me some thoughts on the prospect of this becoming the the next phase in this invasion where people are actually displaced. But Doc, you, you go first on this one. Right. Yeah. This reminds me of a uh, 12th of May, 2004, uh, Mike Bravo sector of Baghdad when my truck was hit by an IED and uh, the neighborhood was empty. You know, the, the smell, you know, you know, when you're left a bang versus right a bang and you're responding. So, you know, 155 versus Humvee, you know, was an ugly day. Uh, I was fortunate to survive because we didn't drive directly over it. So that's the, the look, right? So that's that feel. And now you look at um, and, and, and nowhere near, you know, Nance's experience. I mean, I, I was not anywhere near. Uh, I was I was blessed that day. Um, but when I look at things like that in environments like that, and I've, you know, in my career in SF, you know, years of, you know, going down for 39 years, total 20 of it in SF. Um, I, 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 you can see that and you just know that something's coming and somebody got a leaflet, somebody got told, you know, psyop or not, you got to vacate this AO because this area of operations, because this is about to get ugly. And so that's, a, that's a preparatory thing. That's a decision point thing. That's for a commander. That's a, okay. This is now a cue. When I get three cues and left a bang, which is combat hunter in the Marines, uh, I taught it to the Marines at Guantanamo under soft sat, which is a different SF side of the house. So when we see the third, the third cue, we already have to had made a decision under our OODA loop principles. So at this point now I'm going, okay, this is emptied out. There's something bigger company coming because that's not just a street where there were vendors one day and now there's an IED. No, this is a, an area a blocks, blocks, blocks or an area. That's telling me something bigger is coming on the ground. Yeah. Somebody else want to weigh in on Jeff, you want to turn your mic on? Jeff Nicholas and then Jeff MD. It just made me wonder if if that's the northern part of Israel. Are the, are they are they getting word that uh, Turkey and Syria and everything else is gonna maybe kind of join in on this and then you're gonna have an invasion from the north? Um, you know, it's just funny. I when I when I read you know, that, that could be the Ezekiel 38 battle that's supposed to happen at some point here in the future. Could be now. You never know. Yeah, my, my understanding is, is that most of those abandoned areas are on the border with Lebanon, between Israel and Lebanon. But it's yeah. that's northern Israel, right? Yeah, that's where it's going to be coming from. Right. Yeah. 
Jeff yeah, Emmons. Stuff. Well, the, the locals know what's going on in their own neighborhoods. They see it happening. And, you know, like in Iraq and in Afghanistan and places like that, something was going to go down. The locals, they got the hell out of there. They weren't stupid. They, they got their wives and their kids and they left. It's one of those, I can't stop you from shooting, but I can sure as hell not be downrange when you do. Um, so a lot of times that's the locals getting the heads up and, you know, the people coming in need to pay attention to that. If there aren't any locals, you got to ask yourself why. Good, good point. Uh, Randy and Mike, I want to get your input. And then Don, I have a question for you after they go, Randy, do you want to go first comments on people abandoning their homes like this? You've seen it, right? Well, it's an indicator. Like everybody has said, it's an indicator that you need to pay attention to and, and know why that is. Well, you definitely need to proceed with caution because something's coming. There's no doubt about that. So as an indicator, we could kind of put this on the board for, you know, the survival community, Americans in general, that if you see people abandoning their homes and possessions in areas like that, that's a, a bad premonition of what's fixed to happen, essentially. Well, it's not normal. I mean, people don't just normally do that for no reason. Yeah. Mike, your comments? Yeah, you got to smell the air, man. Uh, that's that was one of the things that we always used to do. We would be we we might be working on a on a uh, you know early on in Iraq we'd be working on a on a big IED, and then and you'd have all kinds of people around, and then all of a sudden, all the looky loos disappear. And as soon as the looky loos disappear, the mortars are coming in next. <laughs> and I hated that time because we weren't done usually, and that sucks. It was because some of those looky loos called in the mortar strike. Right. <laughs> exactly. Which is why we, we, uh, I usually trained our security guys real heavily to first run a video camera across the entire crowd and look for the guy standing there with a, with a, with a camera. Well, in, in Afghanistan, you always had the kid on the bicycle who's riding up and down and up and down in front of your compound because he's just marking distance. Mm -hmm. That's crazy. Don, everything. That, that the rest of the panel has said on this particular particular topic kind of comes down to something that you spend a fair bit of time focusing on that's situational awareness and the, the mindset from that do you want to just speak to that in, in terms of i i think the doc mentioned it you know you've got three indicators it's it's time to get out of dodge and we seem to be the only creatures on earth who will ignore the warning signs and not vacate of dangerous place but just just give me your comments on that because I know it's something that you're very skilled at. And well, sure, Chris. You know, I, I was just thinking, all the other folks are talking. Uh, I, I spent a couple months living with the Kurds, and when I was driving up there, the interpreter said, "Do you know why you don't see any trees up here?" I said, "No, why?" Saddam had them all torn down so the people had no place to hide. Do you know why there aren't any men here? They were killed. I mean. Um, so they were preparing for the land. No play, nobody had a place to hide. There were no fighters fighting back at Saddam's organization. It was, uh, I, I had that same sense, like something bad is going to happen here. But yeah, uh, the way Mike described it, you have to have that sense. And the way Jeff said it, when you go anywhere, even in where we live here in the United States, at different places, um, you have a sixth sense. Our sixth sense is based on our experiences our gut feeling is built on everything we've gone through in our lives, which is a lot. What's a 200 years worth of experience here we're talking about on bringing it back to the United States. I moved away from the city. I, I, I don't want to be around city people. I look around. How many flags do you see flying in a city? American flags, you know, and look at the people you have in our cities. I believe a lot of people like us will be moving away from these cities. When I moved out to the mountain I live on now, uh, a couple of days after I moved there, this man came down the mountain with a cake that his wife made, a homemade cake. They said, welcome to the neighborhood. We're glad to have you here. The seven of us who live here and don't worry about locking your doors. It's not like we have a little bit of crime here. We've never had crime here. And, and it feels like that's, that's where we need to be going. Um, and it's based on what we're seeing in the cities and, and in other countries, of course. You've got to stay away from those areas. But that's, that's what I feel when I'm near a city. That same gut feeling like, get away. Something bad's going to happen here. Let's get out of here before something does happen. 
And yeah, there's a wildlife back. wildlife analogy to the of this. And you know, we have dove and quail that that we feed, and all of a sudden we'll be on the back part patio, and all of a sudden there'll be this so all these dove and quail take off. And the first thing we do is, where's the hawk? And then within a few seconds, you'll see the hawk zipping by because the birds don't hang around to see what the hawk's going to do. They get the hell out of there. Ameri humans are dumb enough to say, wow, that's a tank. Let's see if it fires its gun. You know, no, you get the hell out of there. But, uh, you know, Don's absolutely right. I mean, we live in a neighborhood where I literally, and I make a point of knowing everybody in my neighborhood, every house, I know what cars they drive. I know everybody's name. I know where they're from. I know their politics. But you have to, because you need to know if a car comes in, is it a stranger? Is it your neighbor? And you need to know who you can rely on in, in, in a pinch. Did, did you get a warrant to spy on your neighbors or did you just do it under FISA? Um, yeah, I did it under uh, JEFSA. It's my own FISA. <laughs> Fair but no, we make a point anytime somebody moves in, we make a point of having a big kind of a happy hour party so everybody can meet them. And then right. you can also kind of get a beat on them too. The way things used to be. Mike, did you want to add something before we move on? Yeah, I wanted to ask Jeff if he was tied to a federal or a federal task force, uh, you know, because we all know, you know, the company is not allowed to work in CONUS. That's not true. <laughs> Actually, it's not true. This, the CIA is allowed to work in CONUS. We're not allowed to collect information on U.S. citizens, but we can work against foreigners. And when has that United stopped States. you? <laughs> I'm just saying, big chunk of my career, man. <laughs> All right, so we're we're going to change gears a little bit before we get to you know some fairly succinct recommendations for our audience. But we had a look at this on yesterday's episode, uh, sorry, Monday's episode of Survival Dispatch News Live, and this triangular object that was recorded over Israel on uh, Saturday evening, Saturday evening for us at least, that. Appears to be, I think, in Don Mann's words yesterday, I asked Don, what is this? And Don's response was something we have never seen before. Do, does anybody want to weigh in on this? And and I know we've discussed it, and we discussed it prior to the, the recording as well. But I'm also interested in our audience weighing in on what this may be. We, we've had some suggestions, could be a, uh, some rumored uh, craft from Raytheon. They gave us a couple of models that... Uh, anti-gravity aircraft i believe it was called but does anybody want to weigh in, in on this right now because it certainly doesn't look like anything i've seen before who wants to go first well i'll say one thing is you can't tell if it's stationary or moving you don't know if the cameraman is tracking it like an air like a, a plane flying through the sky or if it's just sitting there if right. it's just sitting there okay that's weird now could it be you know, a C-130 with some sort of airborne, you know, anti-drone technology on board and it's flying along. Yeah, I could. But, you know, I, I can't I couldn't say one way or the other unless I know if it's moving or not. Anybody else want to take a stab at this or we're going to leave it for the audience? Don. You're on mute, Don. I, I feel the same. I I think it's something, you know, with China, Iran, Israel, the U.S., it could be something that's out there. It's been in the, the dark shadows for a while, and now it's out. We released it for the first time, or somebody released it for the first time, and it's the first time we've seen it. It's the only thing I could come up with. It's pretty impressive at tracking those ICBMs and plucking them out of the air. Doc, you got any comments on this? No, nothing that size. You know, From this distance, that's a pretty good size drone. We've seen some, what we call down here in Texas, the Dorito chip drones, the smaller versions which are kind of uh, an Iranian design, but I have not seen them myself. I've just heard about that, but I can't confirm with any reputable uh, re source on that. I got a quick question for you, Doc, that just dawned on me as well. Unfortunately, Keith Graves couldn't join us today. Uh, Keith, 30 year uh, drug and gang interdiction specialist, law enforcement. Now he teaches law enforcement. I, you made a comment to me that the drones used by the cartels in many cases are Iranian drones. And, uh, Keith has laid out some evidence in the past that that's the case as well, that Hezbollah has been cooperative with uh, the cartels for three decades. 
I just want to hear you confirm that from the front. Oh point. yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On the three decades, I, I can't, you know, I don't know how long, but I knew that when I came into the Texas national guard and this isn't anything from red side, this is just us having conversations that, uh, that we, you know, kind of a bolo report, you know, Hey, you're taking over the border. Hey, check this out. You could possibly see. So, you know, uh, but I did see the increase in number of drones. I saw them myself. These were store-bought drones that were, you know, usually flying over us looking, but then we had the ones that carried uh, payloads and they, they, they could be easily transferred over to a uh, munition payload, but these were more just carrying cargo of which when we know it's going north, it's either guns or, or product. So it wasn't guns. I would definitely see that, but uh, that, yeah, there, there is for sure, for sure a, an affiliation between Venezuela and the Iranians, because we, we know that they, they have run an operation where they were doing, uh, like I said, Venezuelan documentation on Iranians that were trained pretty well to speak uh, speak Spanish. And last time, last time we spoke, Doc, uh, I mentioned that there have been some reports of the cartels uh, using kinetic weapons mounted to Iranian drones to attack each other, but we haven't seen that on our side of the border yet. Is that correct? <clears throat> well, aside from that Lakota going down, I, I still want to see the report on that. Unfortunately, that's a Title 10 operation, so I won't see that. And I'm, and I'm out of the guard anyway, Title 32 or state active duty. So I don't I wouldn't see that. But the people that were investigating it uh, uh, have not ruled total yet. And we may never see the results of that. So I would say that if you've got somebody tracking a drone uh, flying and then they then they actually track the, the same camera tracks, the helicopter crashing, and then they applaud afterwards. Um, that, that puts a little bit of, uh, hair up on my neck, you know, stand up. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Mike. So the Dorito chips that, uh, that you're talking about, that's the Iranian, uh, Shahid family. Um, and generally speaking, you're talking about a 40 kilo payload on those, but that's at 800 miles. So you could probably increase that payload. Right. and reduce your fuel and, and, and uh, conversion and wise that. that's 88 pounds so yes guess that's 88 pounds yeah, yeah. um <clears throat> but uh yeah we've been we've seen a lot of those and as a matter of fact those the shaheed family is predominantly what was used the other night against the israelis uh, because they can go out to 2500 kilometers yep. Anybody good, having, yeah. sorry go ahead no, I just say that that is a concern. Yeah. And we know that on this on the Mike side, this understand this that from day one of Operation Lone Star for me, day one, just in the town of Miguel Aleman, which is 400 meters across the river, uh, it's a highly contested uh between the cartel del Noreste and the uh, uh CNJG, mm. that that location is fought over all the time. Now we're seeing them use drones with munitions in Mexico. That's been reported open source. So it wouldn't take much just to move it north and and to use that and you know what's going to stop them yeah it, i couldn't agree more so i'm going to share something that we've mentioned another number of times but we haven't actually shown it if people go to our website and you go to the connect menu up top we have a bunch of free downloads including a guide on how to prepare a home defense plan so we don't provide a plan that's something you're to follow verbatim. We provide a guide essentially so you can create your own home defense plan. So as this stuff, uh, unfortunately, probably kicks off this year in an election year, uh, and even if it doesn't, you should still have a home defense plan that everybody should be aware of and have you know maximum protection. We've discussed this many, many times on fortifying your home, those sort of things, but you can get that for free on our website. And Beyond that, I want to get into, pardon me, some of the recommendations for individuals. So, Doc, let's start with you as far as your recommendations for, you know, Joe Average. This, this stuff happens, let's say, okay, so the, the, the grid gets knocked offline, comms are down, there's simultaneous attacks happening. What does the average person do? Right. So this is something I work on heavily down here. I work with a lot of citizens groups. So these are neighborhood watch programs, if you will. That are out there doing this this very thing and something jeff said was the first question i asked him is does everybody here whether if you live in a neighborhood a lot of people live rural but uh do you know your neighbors number one and and many of them say no i don't even know my next door neighbor well, okay well there's problem number one because that's your inner outer ring of security that's your inner ring at that point 
And then the, let's say the county that I'm in, they have a, a weekly meeting and they get together and talk about things as canning or power generation or the three most important things that I tell them is water, water and water. OK, mm -hmm. so, you know, we got to make sure water is covered because you don't have that much time without it. You know, air, you're going to have to you know be able to make it longer than three minutes, but water, you're going to have to have it. And then I say, well, the most common question is from a, from a lay person is, um, well, how long? Well, I don't know. Because the answer to all those questions is depends, but at least be able to do, I just give them the rule of threes. And I just say three days, three months, and then something to then uh, continue for three years. Now the group mentality, more survival there, right? Uh, so and I, I talk to groups all the way up to Alaska and uh, Idaho, and some of those things are really robust, a lot more resources. When I talk to people in the Big Bend region of Texas, you're talking about the Chihuahuan Desert. Uh, you got to start learning how to to uh, pull water out of a cactus, but they're going to do it. And so we we find those methods, and then you know then medicine. Medicine is is key critical because ninety percent of what we looked at downrange was disease of non battle injury, not wounds in action. DNBI, that that's going to take down a, a just like our question earlier. It's going to take down a team. I was in the mountains of of you know Nepal with a team, and everybody got you know drank the chai when it was boiled at altitude. And guess what? still had bugs in it. And so the whole team was, you know, puking and, you know, coming out the backside, including me, you know, cause I was the knucklehead that should have known about the, you know, ideal gas law and forgot. And then we're all drinking this nasty chai and looking at each other like, okay, this is going to be bad, but it'll take a team out. You're combat ineffective at that point. So we, we were able to, to come over, you know, we had the medication right to, to get through that. So having that robust package to then uh, if I don't have medications, what could I have? Well, I might be the guy that, that you know, has the bee, bee nest or whatever they call this thing, the box, right? And I'm, I'm making honey. Well, then I would trade and that's your barter system. And now you develop this uh, trading post mentality. Uh, for us, it's, you know, I, I work at a distillery brewery. Well, we got a lot of alcohol, so you can always trade that. You yeah. can also use it for medicinal purposes. So there's, there, that's, that's the kind of thing that you, you got, you know, what I do is I go in and create all, just like I would if it was unconventional warfare, which by the way, we're in. Uh, this is just domestic internal defense other than foreign de internal defense. But I would create the different sections, the S section. So, hey, you're good at admin. OK, you do admin stuff. OK, you're good at medical. Even if you're, you know, the, you work in the back of a, a box truck. OK, I got it. But you can at least put on a bandage right. But the disease of non-battle injury stuff, the preventative medicine is key. That's digging a good latrine. Remember, never, never always drink upstream of the herd. Right. I mean, a simple term. But those kind of things make a difference in long term survival. So those little things, because I don't know how long I really don't, but I'm going to be prepared as long as I can. That, that's great advice, Doc. So I just want to say when you don't know your neighbors, then that's when uh, the Mike Sterling doctrine comes into effect. And uh, this question gets asked, Mike, you want to expand on that horrible movie, but uh <laughs> The, the premise behind this picture is what mike what kind of an american are you yeah it really crappy movie that was pretty you know anti right-wing patriot but it's really not it's that, just kind of not a great movie but good question to ask though right yeah, yeah are, but, but I mean, really, honestly you have to ask that kind of answer that kind of question what kind of an american are you are you an mlock american or are you a key mod american <laughs> <laughs> well one thing mike has an advantage is he lives out in the boondocks surrounded by a bunch of heavily armed rednecks so i call it his redneck minefield that's right i got my redneck shield man i have nothing to worry about the only thing i sweat is a couple of tweakers now and then and you know what shooting tweakers out here there's not even a season on them <laughs> or a limit <laughs> In case you didn't get the memo from Keith Graves, you're not allowed to call people tweakers. That's politically incorrect. Yeah, watch me. <laughs> Don, I'm going to go to you. I'm just basically doing a final loop on my screen here. So you're next. Uh, recommendations for average people to prepare for the worst while hoping for the best. Well, you know, you could just ask questions. If you've got kids, grandkids, neighbors, what would you do if uh, your power went out? I did this yesterday with my neighbor, actually. It's actually my girlfriend's neighbor. He was uh, outside and he had a hurt back, so he couldn't move much. And I was talking about the grid going down. I said, what would you do if you couldn't use your cell phone? What would your wife and daughter do if they couldn't make a phone call? Pretty much you're stuck. 
what would you do if you can't go to the store and get groceries because it's either been looted out or it's closed down? What are you going to do? Why not ask your family and friends these questions and just get them thinking? Just get them thinking. I think that's the uh, the best thing I could be doing right now is asking questions and saying, you know, what would you do if you had a bleeder? How would you stop that bleeder? You know, where are you going to get food if the grocery store is down? How can you purify water? You know, you have a river there. What ways can you purify it? If they don't know, tell them iodine, tell them whatever, chlorine, bleach. But um, start asking questions and try to help people to start thinking what what could happen. I, I saw an interview, Don, of somebody interviewing uh, one of these you know, young kids who's having uh, anxiety over climate change and who wants to ban cows and ban farmers. And if it was a spoof, they were darn good actors because they asked this young girl, if if we shut down all the farmers, where are you going to get food? And guess what her answer was? I'm afraid to ask. Fast food restaurants. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you look around, look at the people nowadays. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary thing. It is. Jeff, MD, you're up. Well, I agree with what everybody else has been saying um, and, and making sure that you've got enough supplies for you and your family. And as Keith would say, maybe some to donate to people who need it. Mm. But uh, I think working with your, the people in your neighborhood or your friends or your family that are close by to kind of build a, a workable defense unit for your for where you are um, i just met with a neighbor over the weekend who is he's got more stuff than i do he's got probably more stuff than all of us combined but he was saying his big concern was water and i said i've got fourteen thousand gallon swimming pool i'll tr i'll give you water if you need water but on the flip side if i need ammo <laughs> you know um but and he's got radios and I got radios and we agreed, OK, we're going to we're going to figure out, make sure they they communicate with each other. We're going to set a frequency to where if something happens and he travels a lot. And I said, something happens. Have your wife call me. You know, we'll be down there to take care of her and vice versa. So we're starting to build a, a bit of a little network of people who who can defend themselves. But we have a lot of really kind of old people who might mean well, but physically just can't do it. And so we're going to say, well, we've got, there are neighbors, there are friends. We're going to have to make effort to protect them as well. I, Jeff, I had a podcast running a while ago and I like to have background noise when I'm working. And it, it was a, a veteran. I just can't remember who it was essentially stated that in the civil war, the lines of demarcation were pretty straightforward North versus South and that what we have now is is this brutal chasm between, call it conservatives, liberals, whatever you want to refer to them as, and that now it's down to a neighborhood level. And, you know, we've we've got a saying here in Florida, you know, the difference between a Yankee and a damn Yankee is that Yankees go home. And the problem <laughs> is, is that we, and don't get me wrong, there's lots of nice people up north. I'm not making broad generalizations, but we have people, we're in an older established uh, subdivision on the outskirts of town. We have a number of people who have moved here because in case you didn't get the memo, Florida starts at Jacksonville ends at St. Augustine and everything south there is an extension of Michigan, Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York. And they have vastly different beliefs than the rest of us in this neighborhood. So the people who put out the Hillary, the Biden, the Obama signs, and to be quite frank, you can walk over to them, you can introduce yourself, you can say hi, and they look at you like you got three eyes growing out of your skull, don't even address you and walk back in their homes. So the, the I agree with you, like a mutual assistance group, your neighborhood group makes sense, but there's some parts of the country where that's at least not possible well, and i i always ask people one of the first things i'll like the, the the husband i'll say hey do you shoot and if they own guns they're probably on your side or uh, this guy says well i don't but i want to start and i said we can work on that <laughs> yeah good stuff jeff nicholas advice to our, our fellow americans on should this crap kick off what are the things that they should do in advance well if we, if like, if you do have the plan, like Doc Peter says, out to three years, we're done as a country. I think what people are going to need to be prepared for is more of the short term. Have a plan, because remember, in the army, we always said the plan is the foundation for change. So, how can be flexible? How if you don't have an initial plan to begin with, 
And I'll just leave. The last statement is this. It's better to have it, not need it, than need it, not have it. That's it. Yeah. Yep. Uh, to the point and wise. Randy, your advice? Yeah, everybody's getting great advice on that. Jeff, you just remind me of something. But I always heard an old command sergeant major, man. He would always say, man, you need to maintain a rigid state of flexibility. The first time he said that, I was like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> oh. <clears throat> but Don't read into it too far. Don't read into it too hey, far. Hey, our, <laughs> our other term was this, Semper Gumby. Always flexible, <laughs> right? Always. So uh, I think everybody's giving good, great advice, uh, so I won't repeat all those. But for me, it's it just definitely going to come down to the water because one of the things I've done for food, but I will I would need water is you know i have a i have a ton i probably have 100 pounds of rice <laughs> and 100 pounds of all kinds of beans because you know that kind of food doesn't need a refrigerator as long as you keep it dry hence dry and and the bugs out of it that stuff you can keep it forever but you will need water to cook it you know that's that's what it'll come down to but at least i have food you know and uh and it comes down to your water supply that's going to be the biggest piece right there so good good advice randy Mike, before you give your answer, <clears throat> reiterate the importance of a, a local area study and give uh, the guys at Forward Observer a, a shout out while you're at it. <clears throat> well, um, so as we as we have seen in virtually every major SHTF situation around the world that we have studied, uh, the people that survive are the people that organize either before or the fastest. Period. Got to come together as a group. Villages are a thing for a reason. Mutual mutual assistance. Um, and how do you know that? One, you got to know your neighbors, right? If you don't know your neighbors first, just like just like Jeff was saying, if you don't know your neighbors, you don't know anything. Um, and that all comes down to uh, what we call intelligence preparation of the battlefield. But the the nice folks from Forward Observer always say uh, that is called performing an area study of your area. If you have no intelligence. What are you actually basing your decisions on? Nothing. You're taking a swag, okay? A silly, wild-ass guess. And that is a terrible place to be in a shooting situation. You're guessing? That's not good, okay? that Those are things that we would take the S2 outside and beat them with tent poles for, okay? <laughs> so, perform an area study of your area, the folks over at Forward Observer, Mike Shelby and the guys over there, man, they have got it down to a science. Perform an area study. Oh, but Mike, I'm not an intelligence person. Guess what? I'm not either. I am a geek. I went over there. I took a look at this stuff. I picked it up in about 45 seconds. I didn't even need to take Mike's class. Okay. Do I suggest that you take a class? Yes, absolutely. Take one of his classes if you can, right? Take one person from your group designate them as your intelligence guy, send him to one of his classes. It is outstanding information. I've worked in the intelligence space. I didn't need to. I I, I knew what we were basically doing once once it, it uh, shined on me. But I'm here to tell you, I kicked myself in the ass since I, I took a look at that because I spent years doing prepping and not doing an intelligence prep. It's if you don't, know what you're doing you have nothing yes sorry yeah well it's worth mentioning that mike shelby uh periodically does free workshops on this topic yeah he does those online and man they're it's, exactly. it's worth every penny you spend on it yeah especially mostly your time humans. yeah yeah so other than that anything else you want to point out that people should be doing or organize prep? intel train if you are not trained you have nothing um Possession does not equate to performance. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have no proficiency. You will fall to the level of your training. If you are untrained, you're going to go to condition black. Done. Yeah. A hundred percent on that. I, I was actually, I had two things on my list and one of them was the training uh, because you, you know, these are perishable skills, everything. It doesn't matter if it's shooting or anything else, any of these survival skills, if you, it's use it or lose it sort of thing. And uh, the other one that nobody's touched on, but Don Mann speaks very eloquently on frequently, and Randy can speak to this as well, is maintain a level of physical fitness. You know, we've, 
we've discussed this over and over again. And in general, when we have discussions inside the influencer community with guys like Mike Glover, I said to Mike when we were shooting one of Don's shows, I said, my assessment of the survival community is that they want to learn, but only if it's not a heavy lift. And he said, that's probably the most concise uh, definition that he's heard that he agrees with. But that doesn't mean that it can't be changed. Doesn't mean that we can't, you know, make inroads and and improve that situation. But if you're not physically fit, and the doc can speak to this, if you don't, your health's not good in general. Boy, howdy, when the shit hits the fan, uh, you're probably not going to fare too well. You want to add anything to that, doc? Before we do the conflict of question, I would. Yeah, with Mike Glover, we were up in Montana teaching some folks uh, how to survive for a week, and. Uh, you know, me as the doc, you know, because I'm I put heart rate monitors on people before we did something because we don't know what level they're coming in at. But some people that really could shoot well, right? They had already trained a little bit and they could they could somewhat move, they could communicate. But when we put the stress on them, we ran them through a, a squirter kind of a range. Um, and I won't give away the secrets, but I'll just say that I would I would look at their heart rate monitors right before I had them do a medical treatment on somebody on a on a recessa ante and then move the thing and all this stuff. Literally um conditioned black, auditory exclusion, peripheral vision was gone. Uh the same things that we see with, you know, we're talking mindset things. So before and after, and then after we trained a little bit, just said, okay, here's how you breathe. And here's how you look around. This is your situation awareness. This is take your own pulse first. As I would tell some of the paramedics when they come in and coding a patient and just like stand back and take your pulse. Why? I'm just tell me what your heart rate is. Well, that's 185, sir. I'm like, okay, go outside and rest and come back in. I'll handle this. So what we do is like, you know, we, we, we teach them and Mike does a great job up there in that course mm -hmm. of doing that. Um, and, but, but it has to be done under stress inoculation, right? Stress inoculation training is what really helps to do that. It's not just the, the Zen breathing. That's part of it. It's not just the mindset. That's part of it. But mindset is the base for with it, which then we add layers of shoot, move, communicate, medicate. Those are just your base skills. Then we could talk about S2 skills and all those other things. But you're going to go to Condition Black because it's absolutely right. Mike is absolutely right. You will fall to the level of your training. Yeah, thanks, Doc. So the, uh, the S2 officer went to the commander and said, sir, I've got good news and bad news. The good news is we found the enemy. The bad news is it's us. <laughs> don't, don't, don't be your own worst enemy. True. Randy, since you, I, I mean, you've done incredible things since having, uh, you know, a brutal go with losing your leg and you train people, you know, that are handicapped or less abled, whatever the right term is these days. I would, I'd like to hear your your thoughts on people being in physically decent shape, fitness wise, regardless of what challenges they may face. Well, I kind of put it towards like a boxing match, right? Because anybody, if you can go train in your garage or in a gym and sit there and tap that bag all day, and you think, oh man, I'm in shape. But the first time you get in an actual boxing match or a fight where you're at a hundred percent max the whole time, you suddenly realize you have no juice left. You know, and one of the things you tapped on a minute ago that we talked about a couple of days ago, what people that need to understand that are going to watch this show that don't understand or haven't been through any of this or any kind of a stress shooter, the inoculus stress, uh, what happens when you have that adrenaline shot when this these kind of things kick off? For three or four seconds, you have no control over what's going to happen to your body. And your mind just goes and does what you train to do. And you better have good habits because – Whatever habits you have are going to show up in those few seconds, which may be the end of the fight if it's a gunfight. But beyond that, you're still going to lose those fine motor skills for quite a little while uh, that you normally have, certainly even in regular training. So that's where what you have to understand is there's going to there's going to, you're, you're going to, your energy is going to be zapped a lot quicker, and then you're going to lose those fine motor skills. So if you don't train to uh, to, when you experience that, it's like y'all said, you basically, you're going to be done and tapped out fairly, 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 fairly quick in the situation, which will not be good. That will not have a good outcome. We, we know this from working with law enforcement. They, they, you have on average three minutes to win the fight or you're in jeopardy of serious injury or death. You have three minutes or less. I believe that. Don, just because you've been an extreme athlete, and I don't know that our audience knows 
just what that means being an extreme athlete. You know, you got bored with triathlons because it was only a 26.2 mile marathon and then swim X amount of miles and cycle X amount of miles. So you decided to do these, you know, ultra triathlons where you run 262 miles <laughs> and cycle halfway across the continent. I'd like you to wrap up the stuff on the physical fitness. Then we'll do the conflicted question and we'll, we'll call it a wrap. All righty, Chris, you know, I, I was thinking about it. Uh, a lot of times when people ask me what to do to become a SEAL or Special Forces or or Delta Force or somebody, I, I usually have a standard answer. But I'd like to take that answer and break it down into three steps. Sorry about that. I'm outside. Sorry about the noise. No problem. But uh, those three steps are what we should all do in this day and age, no matter what we do for a living, what we do for a hobby, but just to make your home safer, your family safer, and your community safer, just do three things. Every day, do something to make yourself stronger or fitter. And you figure out what that is. But every day, get up, and you know you're going to do something to make yourself stronger or fitter. Every day, do something to make yourself smarter. Learn what's going on. Learn what's going on in Iraq and Israel right now. Learn what's going on in our cities Learn what's going on with the grids going down and the potential of these things going on in our country. And then I think most importantly, every day, go out and do something good for somebody. Go out and do something good for your neighbor. <clears throat> and like how Randy said, I love what Randy said the other day on what a team is, because if you're out there taking care of your family, taking care of your neighbors, I like how Randy said, you don't have to take care of yourself because that's contagious and you're building a team and the team's going to take care of you. You don't have to worry about yourself. Just get stronger every day for you and your community and your family. Get smarter every day and spread that news like we're all doing here. And then do something good for somebody every day. And, and that, that'd be the, the best thing I could come up with saying right now. No, that's great advice, Don. For, for other people who don't know Don's background, when he first went into the Navy, he wanted to be a SEAL. And they said, well, you can't be a SEAL. You have to do another trade first so he became a medic and while he was going through basic training and even beyond that at the end of each day after everybody was burned out don committed to do a thousand of something every day thousand push-ups thousand sit-ups thousand pull-ups whatever it was and he didn't miss a single day he's the one of the most dedicated people i've ever met in my life or anything like that mike sterling conflicted question of the day okay uh, wrapping it up by the way, this is this is great today. I, I, I'm awesome to be here with you, gentlemen. Appreciate it. Okay, conflicted question of the day. A deadly flu outbreak has infected one third of your group, and you don't have the means to quarantine them or the medicine to help them. Do you vote with the rest of your group to banish them from your group? Or do you take it upon yourself to eliminate the infected ones before it spreads any further? Doc, we got to go to you because you're the, you and Don are at the top of the teepee here when it comes to this stuff. Now, let's <laughs> just be for real. This is my life on the border when the mandates came along, right? I mean, this, I, we, we go to train. They want to shut down our training because they use PCR tests, which, you know, we know we're a bunch of crap. But so our, in this particular question here, I'll, I'll just say that, uh, you know, that this this actually because otherwise I'd say, no, I don't even believe the numbers, you know, because if we're looking at it that way. But uh, what would I do? I would uh, I would quarantine them with what I had to do, you know, to keep the training going. We had, you know, a thousand soldiers were trying to get them qualified to go on the border. So we took the guys that tested positive, put them in a different barracks. They still went through their training. We just sent them through with people that tested positive that were that were cadre on the range and we continued the mission. So that's what I would do. And then I would keep a close eye. Now I have the luxury of being a doc, but I mean, most people can have common sense to go, but then I'm going to possibly infect. So, you know, good preventative medicine, if this actually is a disease, but in this world that we're in right now, I question everything. Mike. Doc, you do not have, you do not have the means to quarantine them. That's part of the, part of the conditions here. Son of a gun. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Cut the legs right out from under you. Yeah, then it's almost like a leper colony at that point. Hey, you guys are going to pull out of perimeter security, take a knee, face out, drink water, and uh, let me know how things are out there. That's my infantry grunt coming through. That's oh, a tough one. That sucks so bad. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
that that's a tough one to top don since you've got a fair bit of medical knowledge you're number two well i do what i could medically try to keep those away from those who are healthy the sick but like winston churchill said i wouldn't do either one never ever 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 give up keep that combat mindset going and you know you're going to win and you can't eliminate the people you can't get rid of them protect them as best you can protect yourself as best you can but don't give up and don't eliminate these people there's a there's a will there's a way these people are going to make it and that's what you have to believe fair enough jeff md um well if there's no way to quarantine them that means we've all been living together anyway and flu is airborne so odds are i've already been exposed and everybody else has probably been exposed. So I'm not going to do either one. I'm not going to kick them out and I'm not going to eliminate them because I could kick them out and then I could catch the flu, you know, the next morning and then they're going to be kicking me out. No, I would, you fight through it. You have to. I mean, you in that situation, people like food, water, weapons, anything else are a resource. You can't just throw away a resource. Would you throw away a gun because, you know, you, you know, you had a misfeed? Of course not. You'd fix it. And with those, you may not be able to fix them all, but no, I would not, I would not cast them out and I would not eliminate them. None of the above. So essentially process of natural selection. Well, it's so already natural selection. Adapting you don't right? have, if you can't quarantine, it means you don't have an isolated place. You've mm -hmm. all been living together anyway. Mm -hmm. You're already exposed. Yep. Fair enough. So either you're going to get it or you're not. Jeff Nicholas. Well, being the planners that we were before we deployed, we've got plenty of ivermectin, hydroxychloroquine, and <laughs> uh, zinc and vitamin D. So we're going to get the herd muta We're, we're going to get the herd uh, immunity. We're going to let everybody this thing flow through the camp. We're going to get it knocked out, but we're not going to get rid of anybody. We're going to do what we can. We're going to be Semper Gumby, and uh, we're just going to flow through it and see what happens. Let we'll let the we'll let the Lord take the take the controls randy well you know i can see we uh we're all humanitarian to some degree right uh i guess i would just go back probably the same thing because you go look at the plague we made it through that not everybody got it some people did it's a good point you're already living with them i mean you know the card gives you the choice of basically killing them or separating them but if you don't have i mean how are you going to make them leave one and if you kill them, there's still there's a real problem that you may uh, expose more of it anyway in doing that. So I think it's probably the right move just to uh, hunker it down. You know, either uh, we haven't met a disease yet that killed everybody uh, or that everybody gets. So, you know, I guess you just wait it out. Fair enough. Mike. Well, I don't know about you guys. I'm going to rely exclusively on crystals and essential oils. <laughs> for this uh, i I, th I think that's going to take us completely through this whole thing no I, I i'm with you guys again we have not seen a disease that will kill everybody we're already exposed if we were going to get it we would have got it we're going to push through that's the bet either, either we ride together or we die together that's it yeah fair enough and i i don't really have anything to add to the conversation you all have touched on everything from there so we'll call it a wrap on uh, this Wait, note, are, are are they Democrats? <laughs> oh, come on! <laughs> that was it, Doc. will tell you that Tom Holman said that uh, if our guy gets back in office and Tom is back as the director of uh, of ICE, that on day number one we're going to deport all the Democrats, and on day number two we're going to deport all the illegals. You know? <laughs> oh. What anyway. if they're Maoists? <laughs> uh, I mean, you're thinking at too high a level here, Mike. Jeff, I got a f favor to ask if you'd like to to close this episode of Survival Dispatch News, if you'd say a prayer for our country. You, you talking to me? Yes, sir. Well, well, Father, we just thank you for the opportunity to be here today. We thank you for the opportunity of our fellowship and just ideas. And and Lord, you 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 spring that in. You are the author and finisher of our faith, and you're also the author and finisher of this country, Lord. We and we don't believe that you're done with us. We pray for revival in this land. We pray for um, 
common sense to come back. We pray that godly character and morality and leadership would uh, come back and that you'd raise godly men and women leaders, uh, both in the uh, the government and the military and, and business, that, that we would come back as a country and that you would not just uh, let us languish. We'd ask that you'd forgive our nation of its many sins and that you would come and work in us in a mighty way. We lift you up, and I thank you again for these men. Protect them and their families and our country. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Josh. Thank you. And thank every one of you for your service to our country and your time today. Be safe out there, y'all.